Hello, everybody. Um, again, thank you all for joining us today. I am Dina Henderson. Um, and just a little bit more about what I do over at Turbonomic. Um, I am the Junior Product Marketing Manager on the cloud and cloud native side of things. Um, so I market and educate uh, the educate the market, excuse me, on all fun things cloud and cloud native. Eva Irfan, would you like to say a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, let me start and then uh, because Irfan's got a great uh, re resume that I want him to share. But uh, I've been here at Turbo a little over nine years, but been an IT for over 20. And my role here is to help people that deploy containerized applications, leverage Turbonomic capability to help optimize those applications and optimize the platform, maybe even demystify a little bit, but to uh, basically help people accelerate and onboard more applications onto their Kubernetes technology staff. Uh, we, we don't want any empty clusters. So I'm very excited to share uh, what is, uh, we've been doing this now for five years and um, some of the experiences we have with our customers on how to drive automation and also how to manage that against the source of truth. So Irfan. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm, I'm Irfan. Um, I have been with uh, Bobonomic for close to three years now. Um, in my past experience, I have worked with companies like Motorola and Huawei. Um, apart from that, I have been uh, pretty active in the upstream Kubernetes community also since almost uh, uh, four to five years now. That's like almost starting of the Kubernetes uh, landscape itself. I am associated with uh, multi cluster SIG there, and I maintain a project called QFED. Uh, at Turbo, my main responsibility is like, I mean, I'm uh, mainly responsible for bridging the gap between the upstream, uh, what, whatever is a cool thing over there, and then bringing those uh, cool things into uh, Turbonomic and try to uh, integrate some, some of them with our product. Yep, Eva, can you can continue? Yeah, on. yeah, great, thanks. Or fun. And then Dina, we want to uh, just let people know. Um, yes, we go yeah. to the next slide and I'll just go over that. All right. And just so everyone knows for this presentation, um, we will be talking about what is generally available today. But Eva and Irfan will be touching on some things that are in private preview that will be available down the road. Um, but that distinction will be made clear. And if there's a question around that at all, please let us know or a question in general, um, drop it in the chat and we will get to it during the presentation or at the end. Eva, over to you. <laughs> Excellent. So let's, let's, uh put some framework around um, what we're going to talk about. Um, so first, congratulations to people that have built cloud native applications. And you know, there's some key processes that you've tackled in uh, the building, testing and deploying and managing change in your technology stack, uh, such as a container platform. So the DevOps pipeline is really itself kind of the bread and butter of the DevOps process. Um, adding on to that, uh, now we have an environment, we have applications, we want to manage change and we, but we also want to leverage automation so that we can uh, rapidly deploy and potentially even reverse these changes. So GitOps is a term that uh, I think really best describes these processes and methodologies. And today we're gonna really be focused on GitOps, source of truth. This is where your application or infrastructure as code resides. And this is the process by which you want to, <coughs> excuse me, manage and, and deploy change. And then of course the CD pipeline, the continuous deployment pipeline, this is also important because when you make a change and you've approved a change, you do want to rapidly deploy those changes um, and automate the deployment and update. So shout out to WeaveWorks. You know, I think 
they really coined the term of GitOps back in 2017. And um, this methodology really helps you achieve continuous delivery of applications and changes in a cloud native way. Because first of all, you're gonna have a declarative description and configuration of both applications and infrastructure. Sometimes people start out with that declarative description of infrastructure as you know, infrastructure as code. That was something that was very popular starting out you know, several years ago, maybe about two, three years ago. But also your applications, you have a manifest, a YAML, this describes your deployment or whatever resources that you're going to configure for your application. So the source of truth will be this repository of these manifests. Um, and if you look at Git and the methodologies around that, this provides really a great way to manage versioning and change and approval process and the whole commit process. So, um, uh, Kelsey Hightower, I think everybody knows Kelsey Hightower's, right? GitOps version CICD on top of declarative infrastructure, stop scripting and start shipping, right? Um, our, our, what we want to talk about today is you even go beyond that and now use this methodology to stop scripting, start shipping, and start automating. Automating what we want to, we'll talk about our, what we want to propose is automating optimization. So um, another concept that we will wanna talk about is in your automation, how much approvals do you need for what, what types of changes, right? Um, and we'll talk about that. So we wanted to start out with kind of level setting terminology and our expectations around GitOps. By the way, um, one of the other reasons that we wanna advocate uh, more automation and even automating ways to optimize uh, your applications is that uh, if you look at the Harvard Business Review, this is where we got this study, 60% of DevOps teams will be evaluated on KPIs and performance metrics, including criterion tied to business outcomes. We're seeing that with the DevOps people that we talk to. DevOps is a key persona for uh, turbonomics. And what does that translate to? If, if you're being evaluated on performance metrics of your applications, don't you want to maybe optimize decisions that, or, sorry, automate decisions that optimize the performance of those applications? And when we talk about concepts that we are advocating, you know, the feedback we get from DevOps is, you know, I wish, I wish I spoke to you yesterday, right? I wish we were doing this yesterday. Because managing for performance cannot be manual. There are too many knobs and levers. Kubernetes itself does manage the desired state, right? If something uh, pod stops or re crashes, it will restart, right? But Kubernetes doesn't automate optimization. And we all want to keep this cloud native innovation train moving. Success of cloud native and containerization um, really is, depends on onboarding more applications. So these processes that you're putting in place around CI, CD, and GitOps, you wanna ask yourself an important question. If I wanna keep the innovation train moving, shouldn't I be optimizing and shouldn't I be automating those optimizations and making sure that I'm not introducing more manual processes just to onboard more applications? Questions around capacity planning, questions around how do I introduce optimization changes? Try, to, try not to think manual, think automation. So when, in our experience working with customers, what we see is slowing down that innovation train is, yes, there will be specialized skills of your DevOps teams and SREs. Um, and you, know, you do want those people primarily leverage for helping the application teams, helping the application teams understand what does it mean to onboard this application in the environment. 
the applications themselves are getting more complex. One of the key value propositions of cloud native is decoupling microservices. Well, while that really does hopefully streamline the application development process that I can make changes to key components instead of having to make changes to the everything, it introduces change because now where I had one monolithic system, I'm herding cats. I've got 50 services, each with five replicas. The speed of application growth has really tested the definition of capacity planning. And while we may be more tolerant of over-provisioning, you can't sustain that as your only model to um, make sure that you've got plenty of capacity to onboard the new application. And over-provisioning doesn't guarantee performance. So what happens is our key personas of DevOps and application teams end up in a resource management guessing game. And that just increases more labor. So well, you know, Irfan, Dina, and I are big proponents of cloud native, and we love containerization as that platform that makes cloud native and all the business benefits a reality. What we've done is we've turned our application developers into operators. We have. They, as part of their manifest of, this is my definition of my application that gets deployed, we're asking them, hey, put some limits and requests in there, or hey, I'm going to give you a quota on your namespace and you got to fit within that quota. Now, maybe quotas, Marissa, I think maybe that's another good topic because I could stand on a soapbox all day long about quotas. But um, the reality is the application developers asked to put in specs. And if you're going to ask me to size something, I'm going to size it with plenty of capacity, right? But I don't want to keep revisiting this. Why do I keep revisiting it? Just because the DevOps team is eventually going to say, hey, 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 you're not the only application on this cluster. It's multi-tenant. I got to make room for people. Can we fine tune this, right? It's frustrating. There's a lot of time. There's data flowing around. And, and the return on investment on this effort of the guessing game is not good. So what does a... Kubernetes have at their disposal. So Kubernetes does have some great, you know, um, projects, and there are some really great answers to many problems. But let's talk about the resource management guessing game. So what does someone have? Someone has VPA, Vertical Pod Autoscaler. Okay, that's a thing. Um, but you're asking someone to set some thresholds and you are asking them to kind of understand the VPA methodology. And now, but what if they have horizontally scalable services as well? Okay, well, now, Mr. Mr. Application Developer, I want you to set an HPA policy. Okay, that's another one. That's another threshold-based mechanism. And the challenges here are, what if I want to use these two together? I have a horizontally scalable service, but shouldn't I want to optimize each individual replica? And what do these threshold-based mechanisms actually understand about the running infrastructure? Well, they don't. When a threshold is triggered and HPA says, here, fire up a replica, um, it just hands it over to the scheduler and says, you place it. You'll tell, you'll determine if there's plenty of capacity. Well, that's a thing, but here's the challenge with the Kubernetes scheduler. It only looks at the capacity of the environment on initial placement. It never really continuously optimizes the placement of the existing pods. And instead it relies on two mechanisms. And we could talk about descheduler, but I would still say descheduler is just yet another long line of thresholds that do not correlate. So now HPA hands it over to the scheduler. It, scheduler goes, oh, I don't have anything. I'm gonna just put in pod pending. Now, if a node happens to be under enough pressure, you'll get an eviction. 
But evictions for some services are not great answers. Why? Because, you know, maybe I'm not running, maybe I'm not so stateless, right? Um, and then the, it, then at the end of the day, someone says, well, set another threshold around pod auto scaling. Look, the reality is the best answer is what if I had an analytics system that understood vertical, horizontal scaling, continuous placement, and represented your environment as a supply chain where you have dependencies and the analytics understands these dependencies so that when you generate an action, it is first of all, not a myopic threshold trigger, but it also simulates for you taking the actions and lets you understand dependencies in the infrastructure before you take the actions. So that when you automate, the definition of automation is also full stack. So that is what Turbonomic brings to the table. We bring the ability to get out of monitoring at specific layers of the staff and tools that do this, a policy that does that. And, and now you have to have both DevOps and app, application developers manage separate myopic policies. And the DevOps has got, have got to put this all together for a multi-tenant cluster. So we wanna get out of that. And then we want people to then get actionable decisions and now look at how to automate. So while I do wanna come back to Turbonomics analytics model, I would like to pivot back to what we were originally talking about is you've got a pipeline, you've got a GitOps process methodology. What are the key elements of this uh, CICD and GitOps process for successful automation? Um, I'm going to I'm going to make some um, I'm going to propose that in your source of truth, which you should have, manage change to your manifest, manage change to your applications in your source of truth, but also allow management of these these sizing decisions, this container specs, the limits and requests. If you're defining application resources, allow your source of truth to allow introdu introduction of change because you can take a decision, an action coming from your stress testing environment and you should leverage that in your source of truth and let your source of truth now define and optimize spec, right? Also in your source of truth, think about the relationship of that to your runtime environment. Are you gonna have a one-to-one? -one? Here's my prod cluster. I have a prod definition of my application or one-to-many. Maybe I would like to have my definition of my application be the same across UAT production and test environment, right? So now when you update something in your source of truth, your CD pipeline can then deploy and leverage that change out into the environment and let your CD pipeline actually um, automate that change. Now you may have definitions of where you would like to have your approvals, but if you think about changing a limit or a request, if you trust the analytics, try to mitigate introducing manual processes around approvals, right? There, obviously you want to make sure that any change that you do works, but once you get trust, think about direct commits and direct updates. So continuous optimization should be something that you think about as part of your source of uh, your definition of GitOps and your CD pipelines. And then continuous optimization can modify the resource limits, can even modify the number of replicas, and even modify your cluster capacity by leveraging either built-in cluster autoscalers uh, or leverage your infrastructure as code 
um, source of truth and automation. Um, Turbinomic, we take data and turn that into actions. And we want those actions to reflect back on what matters most, whether it is the response time of an application, um, transaction throughput, and our full stack analysis capabilities really drives actionable decisions where if we need to horizontally scale something or vertically scale something, and we need additional infrastructure, we're going to tell you these things because our actions correlate, right? So in our, we're getting to a, we're gonna do a demonstration for you guys. Um, in the scope of the types of automation that we can drive, whether it is pod moves, cluster scaling, or SLO scaling, one of the things that we want to focus on for you is vertical scaling of the workload. Again, even if you're horizontally scaling, I think this applies to all types of workloads. You need to optimize size because even if you're horizontally scaling, you could be propagating a bad configuration. So for vertical scaling, this is a great example of while there are mechanisms that Turbo provides that you can resize something in the running environment, you should actually maybe resize right back here in your GitOps repo at your source of truth. So I'm going to hand this off to Irfan. Irfan, I'm just going to maybe just high level set this up and then I'll go to the uh, logical diagram of your demo environment. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to piggyback on an environment that is using Argo CD and Git as the source of truth. Argo CD provides for us. So Turbonomic is, maybe I can even take a step back. Turbonomic has a mediation probe that would that runs in the environment in your cluster called Kubi Turbo. In fact, I think uh, there's a link to that project where we also have documentation that talks about all of these use cases. But uh, one of the benefits of being a, a mediation probe that runs in the environment is that we can discover other custom resources. And uh, one of the things that Argo has, Argo CD has an application custom resource, which provides some interesting information for us. It provides the, where is the source of truth and directory and branch information that we can turn around and use to make a commit against the source of truth. Turbonomic is going to, in the demonstration, we're gonna demonstrate, we're gonna execute, we're gonna generate a resize action. Uh, or fun, we'll talk about the application resize action that we have. And we can now execute the change to limits and requests back to the source of truth. Irfan, are we going to do a direct commit or are we going to do a pull request? Uh, uh, we are going to uh, do a direct commit uh, as of now. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, now, one of the things that Irfan's building out is the capabilities to do either. That is really just mechanics, but it's still the same mechanism, we're going to make a change against the source of truth, uh, change limits and requests. Argo CD is going to automatically detect that change and deploy it out, right? Um, this is a private preview feature, as Dina said. What this means is it's beyond beta. And with, as a product manager, I engage with customers to uh, deploy private preview features, we test it out in their environment and then we get feedback. And as product manager, we can even turn around and incorporate that feedback in even as the definition of the MVP before we go public. So Irfan, do you wanna walk us through here? Basically this is, uh, uh, I think I already said a lot of it, but I'd like you to do that and then we can pivot right over to your environment. I'd like to right, have people. Right, so, um... This the, it looks like a lot of detail on the slide, but um, to simplify, um, Turbo uh, here on the left hand uh, of of the screen, the the block which is Turbo, this is uh, our uh, brain or the engine you can say, and uh, this is where all uh, the analytics happen, and it also comprises of the UI where uh, you can see the details of uh, or the result of the uh, the analytics. And those are actionable insights uh, in terms of actions which can be executed and 
uh, when you execute those actions, the uh, the changes to the configuration would be carried out in uh, the given KTS cluster, uh, which is uh, the central block. And <clears throat> in in a normal mode, what we actually do is we use uh, our agent kind of uh, 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 something running inside the cluster, which we call Cube Turbo. Uh, Eva uh, named it as a mediation probe. That's like terminal terminology specific to us. Um, so this this agent uh, basically uh, uh, interacts with the uh, KTS API server and uh, changes the configuration of the resources to bring them to the desired uh, uh, state. Uh, a simple example would be like you have a, a resource, a deployment running with some replicas, and there are some resources applied onto it, and uh, there are limits set on it and requests set on it. But uh, Turbo determines that the current limits and requests are not appropriate. Uh, so it uh, recommends to change those requests or limits, which are the actionable uh, insights. Uh, which on execution, uh, this uh, agent cube turbo will update that uh, onto the deployment spec. So uh, in, in, in a world where uh, this cluster is not managed by the uh, CD pipeline, uh, this will be a direct update onto the resource. But uh, in, in a world where we have uh, a CD pipeline configured and there is a source of truth configured, uh, the update ideally should go back to uh, the source of truth, for example, uh, uh, GitHub, uh, from which uh, a tool like ECOCD might be pulling the uh, information or pulling the changes. Um, so what we also have uh, implemented is, which is a private preview, preview feature right now, that uh, our agent can actually uh, get the information about what are the applications that are being managed by the CD pipeline using the Agu CD application definition itself, and then also use. Um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Maybe th this is what you wanted to do, right? This was probably the the slide that we want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. We can. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this this is uh, the the flow that happens. So, uh, Turbo uh, can send the action, the actionable insight to uh, the Cube Turbo probe, which is our agent in the Kubernetes cluster. And as uh, when, when the action is actually executed, the uh, Cube Turbo probe updates the uh, source of truth. Uh, the way that I'm going to show you right now is that it updates a commit uh, onto uh, the specified branch uh, in, in the source of truth. Uh, so the tool like Argo CD, which is uh, observing the source of truth, can now update the uh, the resource, which is the deployment directly. So um, yeah, I maybe will, I'll, maybe. yeah, stop sharing and we'll hand over to you. Yes. Yeah, I'll move on to uh, environment that I did set up. So I am assuming that. Uh, the audience might not be entirely, uh, entirely, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the knowledge of this uh, uh, software that we have. Um, so I'll give a small preview about that. So this this is something that we call a supply chain, and uh, the supply chain represents the environment that we have uh, basically collected the data or the information from. Um, in uh, I, I'm showing a supply chain which is uh, sort of uh, uh, showing the details which we have collected from uh, Kubernetes clusters and and the entities like individual entities here are uh, something that represent one of the entities or one of the resources in the Kubernetes cluster. So this is the these are the clusters themselves. Uh, these are the nodes in the cluster. The virtual machines are the nodes in the cluster. Namespaces are self-explanatory. Workload controllers are uh, the actual workloads in terms of the deployments, the, the applications which are running the, in the cluster. For example, a deployment or a replica set or a stateful set that we reference them as workload controllers. And if you if you go to the into the details of these workload controllers, we'll also have some information what, what uh, resource this is. Um, uh, these are pods which are uh, uh, self-explanatory. Containers are self-explanatory. Uh, we also have uh, representation of the similar specs of the containers uh, as container specs. So 
uh, deployment might have a pod template spec, which uh, has one uh, container definition in it, and it might have five replicas. Um, so that container definition is what we call the container spec, and those replicas each uh, are represented as individual containers. So um, let me show you one application which I have configured in one of my clusters. Um, yeah, before that, I also should show you uh, the Argo CD pipeline that I have set up. So I have an Argo CD uh, uh, installation in one of the clusters, and that cluster has a couple of applications running in it, and those applications are uh, synced from uh, one of the source of uh, truth that I have configured. So this is this is the repo from where uh, uh, this uh, particular instance of Argo CD is syncing uh, the, those applications from. I'm not syncing the whole repo. I'm syncing a few uh, uh, few folders which have, uh, say, uh, YAML specs in them. And this particular demo, we are showing uh, the updates in the YAML spec directly. But this, the whole concept can be uh, extended to uh, manage Helm charts or, or some alternative mechanisms of uh, managing uh, the, uh, the specs of the resources. Um, let me also show you what uh, is running inside the cluster. So these are the pods which are running uh, uh, inside the cluster, which, which are part of a couple of applications. So there are there are three deployments and they have some bunch of pods here, and uh, these the deployments are uh, the the definitions of the deployments are coming from uh, these folders which I have uh, configured in Argo CD. If you look at uh, any of the the YAMLs, they are standard YAMLs. Uh, it's it's a test workload which uh, drives the CPU utilization to the desired limit, and uh, whatever limits that I specify. Uh, this particular workload always drives the utilization al almost till the limit. That enables us uh, a turbo engine to uh, you know understand okay there is uh, there is some uh, need of updating the limit or you know getting the limit further up so that uh, the the constraint on this uh, uh, application resource could be uh, resolved. That's and th that is what what the actionable insight here is. So if we uh, go ahead and execute, let, let me, before doing that, let me also show you what, uh, if, what is it that uh, the, the actionable insight is trying to show us. Um, so currently, if you see the utilization of uh, the, the CPU utilization is almost 100%, which is configured as 15 millicores. The limit is configured as 15 millicores, and the CPU utilization is almost 100% for that particular uh, container. Um, so the the change which is recommended by the engine is that let's increase the limit to 100 millicores, which which is uh, according to the engine currently very low. And there could be multiple uh, such actions. There could be updates in uh, limits. There could be uh, updates uh, recommended on requests. Uh, there could be, uh, so this is what I'm showing you is the vertical scaling of uh, this particular uh, container. There could be horizontal scaling recommendations also where uh, the, uh, the platform will uh, say that let's increase the replicas on this uh, uh, particular um, workload. So uh, currently, if we see, uh, to be able to appreciate what the changes will happen, if we see there is a particular commit, which is uh, uh, which was updated on uh, 29th March, uh, uh, pr quite, quite some time ago. After executing this particular action, after executing this particular action, we should be able to have a new commit seen on here. And what, what it means is, um, the uh, as per the recommendation from the engine, we are actually updating the limit within this uh, uh, resource YAML, resource spec, to the desired uh, uh, 
or limit uh, suggested by the platform. And uh, if, if, if you don't mind, so then again, uh, Turbonomic has made a analytics decision to change a limit. And then the integration that we built will leverage the definition of this Argo CD application. We've done a direct commit against the, the definition of where that source of truth is. And um, you've shown that the, 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 the Git side where you've got your repo is actually you know, also providing a benefit of tracking these changes. So you could see that um, track, the changes track there, where, which is where is the best place to track changes, quite frankly, right? Right, thanks, thanks for adding that, uh, Eva. Um, so yeah, so we, we also get, as Eva mentioned, that we get uh, the history of the changes over here. So we also know what, what update has been done by uh, which user. In, in our case, it is uh, the Turbo platform itself. Um, and this thing uh, should be picked up by the Argo CD uh, pipeline. And there's the timeout configuration is a little long here. So I'll just uh, refresh all the apps. to pull the changes from uh, the pipeline. So we see one of the uh, apps is being updated right now. And some of the parts should, should be updated. So we see these are the new, new parts that are being created with the updated limits. Yeah, if we did a describe on one of those pods, we would see the update. We should see that. Yep. That limit that is updated is now I should probably do uh, minus a YAML. Yep, this also. Yep. So the, we, we can see that the limit is now updated uh, against this part. Um, yeah, so this is uh, this is uh, sort of showcasing the concept, the uh, the the pipeline or uh, the mechanism that we are in the process of building, and uh, uh, what we want to uh, uh, put out uh, there as one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, mechanisms which can be used to uh, you know push the changes back to source of truth and. Uh, 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 you, where, where uh, a tool like Turbo can be utilized to uh, uh, do the same. Yeah, this is uh, this is mainly what I wanted to show as part of the demo. Um, I'll and, hand it and, over back to. Yeah, I think, and, and yeah. also I think, um, or fun. I think we also want to advocate when I think it's important to think about these different scenarios in in you know when you build out your definition of your GitOps and your, your pipeline. Think about resource specs as something that should be very easily changed, right? Um, right. And uh, that, that's part of the reason we wanted to, um, Irfan was going through some of the details of the setup because um, you saw that these specs were there, they were, they were easy to change, right? Right. Okay. So then, if you don't mind, I'm going to just uh, come back and, sorry, uh, just to wrap it up, um, Dean, I should maybe have you. So I think that to summarize uh, uh, some of the concepts that Irfan demonstrated, first of all, the the, um, it starts with a, the right decision, the right action. And what we are advocating is to uh, build out your GitOps and CD pipelines with the idea that when I have actions that I can, uh, that are optimizing the performance and uh, resource management of my applications, um, you wanna automate those things, but it does start with the right action. And this is, what the turbonomic um, analysis and the engine that Orfan described, these are the use cases that we are driving. We want to help people uh, leverage horizontal scaling of cloud native services and drive 
those decisions with, through service level objectives. Um, we want to, but we also want that to correlate with resource management decisions, whether they're vertical scaling, continuous distribution, redistribution, and even cluster scaling, uh, because these should be all correlated and analyzed together. Uh, minimize the manual labor. That's 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 why we wanted to really push the automation demonstration. Uh, you've got it with Kubernetes and with cloud native applications. You've got the best environment for automation. So do it. Automate the things that you can. Um, we want to help DevOps and application people confidently build out more applications, deploy more services onto the platform, and um, but you don't need to over provision and you don't need to get yourself into allocation models where you don't want to over commit because you're afraid about what's gonna happen. We're gonna help solve those things. So uh, thank you so much, Irfan, for your great demo. Dina, Marissa, back to you. Yes, uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, we had a great presentation. I hope you all agree. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat right now and we'll answer them for you. Otherwise, we will hand it back to the Linux Foundation. There was a question posted a little while ago uh, for which I tried to type the answer if that's something yeah we can go over that one um so the question was what is the best way to do versioning for mono re repo repo mono repo yeah how do we um auto increment for microservices and helm chart using ci cd yep um so i i posted the answer um uh the the concept what I understand is that uh, the updates uh, to, to uh, the Helm chart based uh, deployments would be the update to the chart itself, right? And uh, uh, the update to the chart would be uh, put as a commit onto the charts and a tool like uh, Argo CD would be syncing that uh, uh, to downstream to uh, the environments, uh, ATS environments, right? So um, at, uh, at a given point of time, uh, as a user or as an automation tool like Tur Turbo, which can be used as a uh, tool which can automate these updates, um, uh, you, the, the, uh, the changes could be pushed and they could be versioned also. Like after five changes or after uh, every week, they could be versioned as a, a new release or something. And that's how um, I think I can recommend that uh, you can manage uh, your your uh, microservices uh, which are based on ham charts yeah there's yeah there's definitely different techniques just modifying the values dot yaml you know i think one of the things that i know personally when i talk to people about home who, who want to use helm right as managing it is i i encourage them really make sure you are parameterizing your container specs right um treat them as a variable not as something that needs to be hard coded right um i think that's another concept um that uh i know we've even deployed uh employed ourselves our own application our engine um you know as Irfan referred to it is actually a kubernetes based application uh, managed by a Helm chart operator. So we've even tried to walk our own talk and make sure that uh, with our application, we can size and scale based on the customer's environment that we're actually managing. So um, just to add on a little bit to Irfan's answer. Thanks. Thank you both. Thank you. Um, it looks like that was our one question. So Marisa, I'm gonna hand it back to you. Amazing, thank you so much Eva, Dina and Irfan for your time today. And thank you so much everyone for joining us. Just a quick reminder that this recording will be up on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope that you will join us for future webinars. Thank you so much again, have a wonderful day.